let me introduce myself. I am Mark, a 45-year-old man happily married to Lois, my 42-year-old wife. I'm currently facing a problem related to my beloved wife. I recently found out that she was having an affair with my closest friend, Philosophy. Although I have not yet had time to tell either of them about this discovery, I am still pondering how best to act in this delicate situation. By the will of fate, next month marks the 25th anniversary of our wedding, which indicates the strength of our relationship. Although our two children, Jeff, 23 years old, and Jill, 21 years old, have already chosen their own paths in life, their participation in decision-making will be minimal. Jeff recently got married, and Jill is looking forward to her wedding day. First of all, let me introduce you to my wife. She has captivating beauty, elegant height, and weighs 140 pounds. She has a mature but attractive figure. Unfortunately, like many of her friends, she also begins to notice changes in her physique. These changes are especially noticeable in the example of Penny, the wife of our mutual friend philosophy historically, Phil has always had a wandering eye, but lately, with Penny's weight gain, his penchant for pranks seems to have intensified. Surprisingly, I never expected him to turn his gaze to Lois, although I should have known that her appearance could easily captivate him. I wondered about the reasons for her reaction to his words. Like many other women who experience unwanted attention, as female traits develop, she endured groping, inappropriate remarks, and unwanted courtship throughout our marriage. But as far as I know, she remained loyal and devoted. What happened that made her betray our sacred vows? Has her respect for me diminished? Maybe she fell in love with Phil? Maybe she's thinking about getting a divorce? Did Phil also want to end his marriage to Penny? How long has this been going on? Only she could answer these questions. I had questions for them, but what about myself? What questions did I need answers to? Did I really love Lois? At least I believed in it. If she left me, how would I react? Would I be completely devastated, or perhaps indifferent? Would I ever be able to trust her again if we decided to stay together? But the most pressing issue was my own emotions. Was I overcome with anger, or just disappointed by her betrayal? The whole situation seemed incredibly confusing to me. Let me remind you that in most stories about cheating wives, husbands were devastated and sought solace in alcohol. But this approach did not seem suitable to me. Giving 25 years of your life is a serious decision that should not be taken lightly. This is a serious investment, and I can't help but feel some concern about it. In order to make an informed choice, I understand that I need to talk to her. Only she can give answers to my questions. Having collected all the necessary information, I will be able to determine the best option for further actions. After completing a four-day business trip, I decided to return home a day earlier. I boarded the evening flight, knowing that I would arrive home late. Lois, however, never liked it when I had to leave when the children were not at home. She was left alone, and I thought she would be glad of my early return. I made a spontaneous decision to surprise her without warning her in advance. In retrospect, I should have told her that arriving home at 10 p.m. in my car, which I left at the airport, I decided not to open the garage door. I thought it might scare her because she's probably asleep or engrossed in a book. As I drove up to the house, I noticed that the lights were on in the living room and our bedroom. Sneaking in through the front door with my luggage, I parked it at the entrance, intending to deal with it in the morning. Looking into the living room, I saw two empty wine glasses standing on the coffee table. Stopping in the kitchen to quench my thirst with a glass of water, I went upstairs to our bedroom. As I approached, my attention was attracted by a flickering light coming from a slightly ajar door. At the same time, the sound of quiet voices came to my ear, prompting a strange thought. Maybe she is passionate about a film. But the voice was similar to my wife's. Overcome with curiosity, I cautiously peeked around the corner into the room, where I was greeted by an amazing sight. My best friend Phil was lying next to my wife, and both of them were deeply immersed in their communication. Stunned and speechless, I stood silently and watched what was happening from the doorway, not noticing the lovers who were engaged in their occupation. Initially feeling angry, I decided to remain calm and change my line of behavior. Instead, I went downstairs and took out a newly purchased digital video camera, setting it to low light mode. 
I settled down in a dark hallway and began filming their actions in a dimly lit bedroom for about 15 minutes. After I was completely satisfied with the video, I transferred it to a secure file in the computer lab. Then, I created two backup disks and hid them in different places. As I went up the stairs, I heard his question, can I repeat this again? I've wanted intimacy with you for a long time, and now it's hard for me to resist this desire. I truly believe that I will not be able to resist him, but please keep in mind that he will be coming home tomorrow. It is important that you understand that from my point of view, our previous meeting was not a love affair but just a game, entertainment. I'm leaving making love exclusively for Mark. We're planning to play golf together on Saturday morning. If I feign illness and find a replacement, will you agree to take part in such an act? What about Penny? She doesn't know yet if her mother will have her. Perhaps I'll let you know about it. I went, picked up my luggage from the entrance, and quietly put it in the garage, hiding it behind the cabinets. Quickly changing into worn fishing gear, which was convenient to store there, I quietly left the garage through the side door and headed to the car. Having started the engine, I deftly maneuvered and reversed the car so that it was next to my fishing boat, which was standing next to the garage. Having put everything in order, I set off on my way to the lake, located only three miles away. That night, I decided to spend the night in the car, parking it at the ramp. With the first rise of dawn, I woke up and launched the boat, ready for fishing. Although the shocking events I witnessed were still ringing in my soul, I had not yet had time to fully cope with my emotions. When the sun gradually rose above the horizon, making it clear about its dominance, I carefully put the boat on the trailer and, saying goodbye to the lake, went home. Back in the garage, I parked the boat and trailer, and then went in the side door. To my surprise, Lois's car was still there, which was unusual since she was usually at work at this time. After changing my clothes, I went to the kitchen, where I saw her sitting at the table with an absent expression on her face. It was obvious that she was crying. Sitting down opposite her, I couldn't help noticing an empty glass on the countertop, which seemed unusual to me. Without any preliminaries, she asked me, why did you take the boat? Her tears appeared suddenly, and I was confused not knowing what to say. I asked, do you love him? My love for her made me prioritize her happiness, even if it meant letting her go, but I couldn't accept the idea that she would continue an affair with him. If you really love him, I'll give you a divorce, I reluctantly offered, but I can't take this betrayal anymore. She quickly shook her head, denying any feelings of love for him. It was just sex, nothing more, she admitted. I love you, there was a flicker of hope in her words, but my heart was still heavy with doubts. Then why? I asked, feeling increasingly disappointed. A flash of anger swept over me, and for the first time, I truly felt the full weight of her betrayal. It scared me. I don't know, she replied, her voice filled with uncertainty. I wanted something, but I can't even formulate what exactly. Maybe it's just age catching up with me, but I don't feel attractive anymore. But you're still attractive in my eyes, isn't that enough? What about our wedding vows? I begged, please understand how emotional I am. I can't stand the thought of losing you. How long has this been going on? It was the first time she confessed, with tears in her eyes. How can I be sure of that? How can I trust you again? I promise it will never happen again. Did this happen just because I caught you in the act? No, I've already decided that this is a one-time mistake. Haven't you thought about doing it again with him on Saturday morning? Did you overhear this conversation? Yes, I know that you begged him for intimacy with you, so again, how can I believe in you if we continue this relationship? I refuse to spend the rest of my life as your supervisor. Your actions related to extramarital affairs have destroyed our vow to remain faithful to each other, demonstrating complete disregard for my feelings. As a result, I have lost respect and trust for you. How can we fix the situation if we decide to stay together? I'm at a loss. Can I count on trusting you when you ask me for trust? It sounds absurd, doesn't it? You're absolutely right. I am very sorry that I showed disrespect by contacting him and I ask you very much not to allow discussion of the possibility that we will not be together. Instead, let's approach the situation differently. Imagine that I cheated on you. Give yourself time to think before answering. After a few minutes, she said, 
I would ask you to leave our house and seek legal help, but I don't want that to happen between us. I feel incredibly confused. She continued to sob, and although I wanted to comfort her, I restrained myself. At that moment, my anger began to evaporate, and I realized that I genuinely care about her. I was hoping that we could solve our problems and make peace, but I couldn't help wondering if my love for her was strong enough to forgive her. She was not only the mother of our children but also a person with whom I had a long and intimate history. Despite her shortcomings, I wondered if I could overcome them and restore our relationship. Her physical attractiveness has always fascinated me, and the thought of having to part with her made me realize how much I would miss her. But I thought we needed to take a little break and reassess the situation. Lois, I think it would be better for us to break up temporarily so that you have the opportunity to understand what you really want and find clarity in your feelings. I'm going to pack some things and temporarily stay in a motel until you decide on your next actions. Besides, you have to understand that if we make up, I will never sleep in the bed where you betrayed my trust again. Mark, please don't leave. I'll get rid of the bed quickly and arrange for a new one to be delivered this afternoon. I'm sorry, but I see this as an adjustment stage in our marriage. Please think it over carefully, and when you are ready to discuss our plans, please contact me by mobile phone. As soon as Penny gets home, I will immediately inform her about your actions with philosophy. It is very important that she does not remain in the dark and that Phil does not go unpunished. I no longer consider him a friend, and as long as we are married, he will be forbidden to appear in this house. Considering these circumstances, I decided to pick up my luggage from the garage and started repacking it upstairs. A few minutes later, I went downstairs again and headed for the door. Mark, I'm begging you, what should I tell our children? The responsibility for bringing this situation to them lies with you, but I refuse to take the blame for what happened. I think it is important for us to resolve this issue immediately. I suggest you call within a week, I said carefully, closing the door while she continued to sob. After 20 minutes, I rented a room in a conveniently located holiday and near the highway. Since it was only noon, I decided to have lunch at a restaurant and then head to my office. My early return surprised my colleagues, but I plunged into work to distract myself from my personal problems. I canceled my morning golf plans with everyone except Phil, informing them of my gloomy state. I told them I was unlikely to be able to play with them anytime soon. They asked what the reason was, to which I simply explained that it was necessary to solve personal problems. A few days after I checked into the motel, my son Jeff called me on my cell phone while I was at work. He was worried and asked what was going on. According to him, my mother informed him that I had moved out of the house and was very upset about it. Moreover, she has not been able to go to work for the last two days. Jeff wanted to know if she had revealed the reason for my departure, as she mentioned feeling guilty about something. I advised him to get this information directly from her. I'm worried that if this issue isn't resolved soon, then your mom and I may get divorced. Oh dad, I really hope it doesn't come to that. I'll talk to Jill and see if we can find a way to solve this problem for both of you. All right, son. Goodbye. Goodbye, Dad. It was a gloomy morning when my daughter Jill called me during breakfast at Denny's restaurant. She asked if I could meet my mom later that day. Jill explained that mom did something that made us both angry, but she doesn't think it's a reason for divorce. Jill. I completely agree with both you and Jeff that a one-time mistake is not a sufficient reason for a divorce. But I need guarantees from her that this will not happen again. I want her to explain to me how she plans to regain my trust and respect. In this situation, I feel broken and betrayed. My respect for her is also lost. Dad, I accept your point of view, and we will convey your thoughts to her. Could you talk to her today? Okay, then. At two o'clock in the afternoon? Great. We won't be present at the conversation. It will be just the two of you. I want to tell you that she completely renovated your entire bedroom, repainted the walls, and laid a new carpet. She is truly sorry, and I don't believe she will ever do something like this again. Thank you for your help and support in this situation. We are a family, and we want to stay that way. I felt so proud of our children. When I showed up at the front door at 2 o'clock, there was no need to ring the doorbell. Mark, this is your house too, she said when I walked in. However, Lois, I can't live here until we resolve this issue. Okay, I understand. 
Where would you like to talk? I think the living room would be the right place, I replied, trying to keep the formality and not allow an emotional outburst from either her side or mine. Taking a seat in the armchair, I sat down opposite her when she settled down on the sofa. Watching her haggard and emaciated appearance, I couldn't help but feel a hidden satisfaction that she was going through some kind of trouble. Where should I start? I asked, trying to turn the conversation to her relationship with philosophy. After reflecting on the circumstances, I remembered that you were not at home, and Penny had gone to her mother. When I met Phil at the grocery store, he expressed his dissatisfaction with having to cook himself or dine in restaurants, longing for the comfort of home-cooked dishes. Looking back, I now realize that he subtly hinted at an invitation. Despite this, I couldn't resist the bait and invited him to have dinner with me. I've never liked cooking only for myself and dining alone, so it seemed logical to me to solve our problems together. The idea that it might be indecent did not occur to me since he was bound to Penny by strong love. Before the meal, we had a cocktail, and during dinner, we drank a bottle of wine. I was completely absorbed in our conversation, not paying attention to the fact that we had almost finished the whole bottle of wine. It seemed like he was constantly filling my glass while we were sitting. When dinner was over, he kindly offered to help me clean up the kitchen and wash the dirty dishes, after which we headed to the family room. Sitting next to me on the sofa, we continued to drink wine. Alcohol began to affect me, and I was in a daze. I vaguely remember how he hugged me, and despite the fact that I was going to refuse, I reciprocated. When he unexpectedly kissed me, it led us to the bedroom, and now I understand that at that moment, I was completely not thinking about you or our family. I deeply apologize for what happened, but unfortunately, I can't change the past. Losing you is something I desperately want to avoid. I love you very much, and I need you by my side. I'm trying to figure out why I was so easily influenced by alcohol. I'm not really sure, but I'm willing to seek help from a psychologist or marriage counselor if it means you're coming home. I can't say that I will tolerate your desire to take revenge on me with another woman, but if you insist, I am ready to do it if it helps restore your trust in me. I was relieved to see that she was approaching the situation more rationally, rather than letting emotions take over. It gave me hope for our future. After listening to her explanation, I realized that her meeting with Phil was an isolated incident. Since we got married, there have been no other men in her life. I asked for confirmation, to which she tearfully confirmed that it was true. I wanted to believe her, but I couldn't get rid of the fear that in the future, she would reveal some secrets. Despite my doubts, I agreed to return home that evening and make an attempt to restore our marriage. But I warned her that this path would not be easy. I clearly remember the moment when I saw you with another man in our bed, and the words you said left an indelible mark on my memory. It will take a long time to erase this painful memory. In the meantime, I will live in a spare room to regain the comfort of communicating with you, she replied with visible relief. Okay, I understand. All I want is for you to come home, and we could solve this problem together, she continued. In the evening of the same day, I returned to the house, carefully starting the path of reconciliation, which lasted all weekend. I found solace in her sincere remorse and regret. On Monday morning, while at work, I called Phil and Penny's house to find out if Penny had returned from a trip to her mother's. I was going to meet her in a public place, hoping she'd be home while Phil was at work. Penny, are you free for lunch today? I asked, expressing a desire to talk face to face without the presence of our spouses. Of course, Mark. Let's meet at the TGIF restaurant at noon, she replied. Curiosity seized her, and she asked, is this a surprise for him? You could say that. See you at lunch. It was nearing noon, and I sat down at a table in the back of the restaurant. Penny soon appeared and took the seat across from me. With a puzzled look, she asked, so, Mark, what does all this mean? After we had a drink, she started a conversation. Without thinking, I began to tell about the events that happened while she was not at home. Unexpectedly returning home from a business trip, I found Phil and Lois in an intimate embrace. In this regard, Lois and I briefly broke up, but later reconciled and decided to seek help from a marriage counselor. When I told her about it, she kept an emotionless look, which took me by surprise as I was expecting some kind of emotional outburst. In the end, she broke the silence, 
but her words sounded strained and forced, leaving me completely devastated. So, Lois is the one, she said, leaving me perplexed. What do you mean, Lois is the one? I asked, perplexed. I suspected for a long time that Phil was cheating on me, but I didn't know with whom exactly. Now, with your help, I feel ready to start divorce proceedings against him. I was completely stunned when I found out that Lois was lying to me. It turned out that their affair was not one, but several times. In shock, I hurriedly left the drink money on the table and apologized to Penny, explaining that I needed to go back to the office and collect my thoughts. She assured me that their intimate relationship was more than once but offered her help in getting a divorce, wanting revenge. I informed her that I had video evidence, and she expressed interest in getting a copy of it. Of course, I will definitely send you a copy. When I got to my office, I spent an hour thinking about further actions. In the end, I came to a firm decision, I needed to distance myself from Lois and from the difficult circumstances that surrounded her. I couldn't look at her deceptive expression anymore. I quickly handwrote my resignation letter, which took effect immediately, and left it on my boss's desk while he was busy at a meeting. After that, I immediately scheduled a meeting with my lawyer for the afternoon. Going to the bank, I decided to withdraw $1,000 in cash from half of our savings. I decided to invest the rest in five-year CDs in my name. After that, I took half of our checking account and went to a meeting with our investment representative. During the meeting, I divided half of our investments exclusively into my own name, realizing the need for financial independence. I canceled all joint credit cards and issued one exclusively in my name. To the surprise of my lawyer, Bill Jackson, I immediately filed for divorce proceedings against Lois due to irreconcilable differences. We decided to go to court, and I gave Bill power of attorney to conduct the divorce process. In addition, I changed my will so that our children would inherit my property in the event of my death. I instructed Bill to inform my wife that I had video evidence of her infidelity that I could put on public display if she opposed the divorce. Having resolved these issues, I said goodbye to Bill, promising to inform him of my new contact details as soon as I settled in another place. When I got home, I packed my things, including casual clothes, jeans, shirts, and shoes. I put together a computer and two DVDs with recordings of Lois and Phil's affair and carefully put them in the car. After leaving her a note and a wedding ring, I went on a trip to the West. My dear deceiver, consider this my last communication with you. Feel free to continue your romance with Phil, as I have decided to leave you in this city forever. Expect a message from Bill Jackson in the near future because from now on, he will be our only contact person. Penny informed me about her long-term affair with philosophy. I discreetly left a duplicate of the video at Penny's house before heading west. It won't be long before Lois comes home and finds my farewell message. After driving until 9 o'clock in the evening, I decided to stop for the night and found shelter in a modest motel in a neighboring state. Completely exhausted, I quickly fell asleep as soon as my head touched the pillow. The next morning, I got up, had a hearty breakfast, and continued my journey to the west. When I got to Denver, I successfully sold my car in a private parking lot and immediately purchased another used pickup truck. After that, I headed south towards Mexico. Two days later, I triumphantly crossed the border in Juarez and drove on to Chihuahua. In search of a break, I found a cozy hotel, checked into it, and leaned back in my chair, allowing myself a few days of much-needed rest. I withdrew most of the cash I had and decided to open a checking account at the nearest bank. Fortunately, my previous experience working in Mexican companies through my former employer gave me a basic knowledge of Spanish, which allowed me to cope with the work, gradually improving my language skills. After a week's stay in a motel, I successfully found a cozy furnished apartment and began to live in it. In an effort to find a job, I examined various postings and eventually met a man who helped me get a fake Mexican driver's license under the pseudonym Carlos Martin. Having received new documents, I was happy to start looking for a job in a small local company engaged in cargo transportation. I saw a vacancy where knowledge of English was required for part-time work. It seemed like a good option for me to get started until I found something better. A month later, I was already living in Mexico as a resident and kept my head down. One day, I decided to purchase a prepaid mobile phone and contacted Bill Jackson to tell him my new contact number. Mark, where have you been? 
You must contact Lois immediately, he exclaimed, annoyed. I replied, Bill, I don't even want to discuss this person. If you mention her again, I will stop this conversation. So, what are we going to do about the divorce, Mark? She doesn't want to agree to a divorce until you have a conversation with her. If we do not provide evidence of other grounds for divorce, for example, adultery, she can delay this process indefinitely, and it can become very expensive, he explained. Did you tell her that I have video evidence of her infidelity? Yes, but I don't believe that only your words will convince her. I'll send you a DVD with a copy of the evidence, and you can judge for yourself. I will contact you again in a couple of weeks to assess our progress, he assured. Okay, Mark. I've prepared the DVD and packed it for you. I gave the text to one of the company's drivers who was heading to Denver with $50 and asked him to send it from there. Two weeks later, I called Bill to find out how the case was going. Hi Bill, this is Mark. Did you manage to send the DVD? Bill replied, yes, it succeeded, and after I looked at it myself, I made a copy and sent it to Lois's lawyer. We have to sign the divorce papers next week. Curious about the copies, I asked, where should I send my copies? Bill replied, can I keep them for now? Let me know when you need them. I agreed and said, all right, Bill, but please let my children know that I will contact them when I am ready to communicate again. After a quarter of a century, my life entered a new phase where a new start was waiting for me. Life continued to go on as usual, and a year has passed since I started my journey in a small trucking company. Thanks to my connections in the States and my experience in business, the company grew exponentially, doubling its size accordingly. I found myself working full-time, the owner of the company and his wife became my close friends and often invited me to their home for delicious dinners and pleasant gatherings. During these meetings, I met several single women, some of whom I started relationships with. Among them, Dolores stood out, especially with whom I began a romantic relationship. She looked so much like Lois that tears came to my eyes in her presence. The connection between us was so deep that I was thinking about marrying her. But the thought that I would have to use my pseudonym in legal documents, such as a marriage certificate, held me back. Dolores apparently knew about my intentions, as she once made a remark to me about it. Darling, someone is watching you, she said. Confused, I asked for clarification. You have someone you still love who is always present in your mind. Who is she, my ex-wife, I replied. Fascinated, she began to ask me about the reasons for our separation. She entered into an extramarital affair with a close friend and tried to cheat her out of it. The memories of her act are still stored in my memory, and I cannot forget or forgive her. Of course, you still have questions that haunt you because otherwise, you would have been able to move on. Perhaps you are right in thinking that this is so. I'm not sure about that. I beg you to come back and meet her face to face, giving yourself the opportunity to vent all the remaining emotions. Are you ready to do this for me? I'll think about it, Dolores. When Dolores left, I thought about her request for a long time. Almost two years have passed since I left home, and I wondered if enough time had passed for all the emotions inside me to settle down, and I would be able to turn to her without the anger that seized me during my departure. The next day, I approached my boss and asked for a two-week vacation to resolve personal issues. To my surprise, he readily granted my request. Worried, I dialed Dolores' number to inform her of my impending departure. You know what, Dolores? I'm leaving, I spoke. She replied with a note of sadness. Darling, if you decide not to come back, I will understand. But if you do come back, I want to ask you something important. Will you marry me? Grinning, I replied, sounds like a deal, Dolores. Anyway, I promise to keep you posted. With that, we said goodbye as friends. The next day, I set off to return to my hometown in the north in my truck. After four days of traveling, I finally got to the place and settled in a familiar place, booking a room under my old name for the holidays. When I sat down, I immediately dialed my son Jeff's number. Dad, where have you been? We've been looking for you for so long, he exclaimed anxiously. I was staying at the Holiday Inn next to the freeway, and I was living abroad, I replied. That's why we couldn't find you. Could you join us for dinner? We have so much to discuss. I'll let Jill know, 
and she and her husband would also like to attend. She's married to a wonderful guy, Dad. Moreover, she is pregnant, and so is my wife. You came back just in time to become a grandfather. Mom is also delighted. Jeff paused for a moment before adding, I don't think you want to hear about my mother, Dad. You really need to visit her. Leaving two years ago and cutting off all contacts was a big mistake. A huge mistake. I disagree. What your mother did is absolutely unforgivable. I only came back to end this once and for all. After that, I'll probably leave forever. Dad, I'm begging you to visit her. She still lives in your former house, and as far as we know, has not dated anyone else during your absence. We are watching her closely. After finishing the conversation, I found myself in a motel room, thinking about my next steps. In the end, I made a decision and headed to our old house. When I drove up to the house, I saw that she was standing at the window and was looking forward to my arrival. It looks like Jeff or Jill told her about my return to town. Entering the house, I silently followed her into the living room and sat down opposite her. Admiring her appearance, I remembered why I was so attracted to her. Finally breaking the silence, I spoke for the first time, noting her well-being. She returned the compliment, saying that I also looked good, but it was time to drop the pleasantries and get down to business by addressing Lois directly. Over the past two years, I have often thought about you and wondered how you live. I'm glad you didn't fight against our divorce. Wait, what kind of divorce, Mark? We're not divorced, Lois's news hit me like a shockwave. We are still legally married. I can't believe it. The last time I talked to Bill, he said you were going to finalize the divorce. What happened? I just couldn't get through it. I got the impression that I had a long-term affair with Phil, but that was a complete lie. So, I decided that the only way to make you listen to me and understand the truth is to refuse to sign the divorce papers. Why didn't Bill tell me about this? To be honest, I have no idea. You need to ask him that. Penny told me you were having a long affair. Why would she invent such a story? After you left, I spoke to Penny and expressed remorse for my inappropriate behavior with philosophy. During our conversation, I asked her why she told you about the affair that lasted a considerable time. She explained that she had suspected Phil of infidelity for a long time, and when you told her that you found us together, she assumed that he had been dating me throughout their relationship. I deeply apologize, but on reflection, I realized that the separation was necessary for me to think about the problems that led to the destruction of our marriage. I think we'll never know if our marriage could have been saved if I hadn't left. But I've been back for a while, hoping to find closure or maybe start over. In our current situation, I didn't expect that we would still be married and planning this meeting, which means that we have to consider another question related to whether you had an affair or not. Do you want to resume a relationship with me? My feelings for you are still not extinguished, but questions of trust and respect do not give me peace. Are you okay with us living together again, Mark? More than anything, I long for your return. I will never be able to apologize enough for my actions, but I want you to know that it happened in a moment of weakness. Although I guarantee that it will never happen again, it's hard for me to find a way to convince you of this. I need time to think about the situation. How about having dinner with the kids tonight and just enjoy our family? I don't want to give them false hope that we will be reunited, but being together with you in such an environment would be a joy for me. I understand that our family is expanding, and I would really like to communicate with them. Lois looked at me, her eyes filled with tears. Both of our children have recently got married and are looking forward to becoming parents. I can't wait to meet my future grandchildren. Are you ready to leave now? If you want, we can go together, I offered with a smile. She smiled back and agreed with pleasure. We decided to schedule a meeting for tomorrow around 7 o'clock in the evening at our house to discuss our future. In the afternoon, we visited Jeff's house and met with our family. It struck me that so many things had happened during my two years of absence, but I really enjoyed getting to know my children and my new son-in-law. At first, there was a slight awkwardness between us because Lois talked about her act. Then, as events unfolded, the atmosphere became more and more calm. Jeff and Jill, in particular, were relieved by our joint arrival, regarding it as a possible reconciliation. 
but I explained privately that we had reached only a temporary agreement to restore trust and respect. In addition, I expressed the hope that they would reflect on our situation and apply it in their own marriages. Both of them said that they had discussed this issue with their partners for a long time and, seeing the difficulties we faced, they made a mutual decision never to abandon their marital obligations. After dinner, I accompanied Lois to our former place of residence and said goodbye to her. Although she invited me in, I politely declined. The fatigue of the trip weighed on me, and I preferred to postpone the resumption of our communication until the next evening when we could talk. Seeing her in such a beautiful form, I could hardly resist the urge to hug and kiss her, but I still forced myself to restrain myself. Before our conversation, I had a great desire to talk to Penny and confirm the information that Lois shared with me. In addition, I needed enough time to think about how we could lay the foundation of mutual trust and respect in a possible future relationship. After a sleepless night spent in thought, I got out of bed, took a shower, and started breakfast. Then, in the morning, I dialed Penny's number, considering that she informed me about her divorce from Phil and about her current lonely living in their former home. It was not difficult to find her. When Penny found out my identity on the other end of the line, she expressed surprise. I've been wanting to tell you for a long time about the mistake I made with Lois and Phil during our last conversation. It turns out that Lois told me, and I later confirmed to Phil, that their relationship was limited to only one occasion. Moreover, Phil confessed to me the identity of another woman he was dating while he was cheating on me. Therefore, I offer my deepest apologies for the erroneous information that I gave you as a result of my incorrect assumptions. I don't regret having to break up for a while to heal old wounds, Penny, as it may have been for the best. I hope we can make peace and restore our old relationship again. I am truly sorry that you have such a situation with philosophy. For a short and insignificant affair, great harm was done. Phil's repeated infidelities reached such an extent that it was already impossible to forgive him. Since then, I have found a new love, and next month we are preparing for the wedding. After our divorce, Phil moved to California, and I haven't heard from him since. I wish you a speedy marriage and hope that our paths will cross again. Having trusted Penny to confirm Lois's words, I now clearly understood what to do. When I talked to Lois that evening at 7 o'clock, I was already standing outside my old house, nervously pressing the doorbell. A few moments later, Lois opened the door and greeted me warmly. Come in, Mark. I've been looking forward to your arrival, she said with a smile. I followed her inside, and we settled down in a cozy living room. As if on cue, Lois returned with two glasses and settled into the chair opposite me. After taking a sip, I plucked up the courage and spoke from the bottom of my heart. Lois, being with you again means more to me than anything in this world. My love for you is so great that it's hard for me to sit here and not give in to the desire to take you in my arms. But if we do not establish new rules, I do not know how we will be able to establish a relationship based on trust and respect again. I was so glad that I was able to confirm with Penny what you told me about being with Phil once, but you told me that you did it in a moment of weakness, and I'm struggling to figure out how to ensure that you will never have such a moment of weakness again. I do not know how I can calm you down, Mark. I can only say once again that it was just an intimate relationship, and I will regret it until I die. When I think about breaking my wedding vow to the person I love, I feel very ashamed. Since returning, I have devoted a lot of time to considering a solution that could restore my trust in you and restore mutual respect to our marriage. This decision is connected with a promise that I am ready to make to you. Yes, a promise I intend to make to you. But I ask you to give me 24 hours to think about it before answering. At the same time, it is important for you to understand that during my absence, I was in a loving relationship with another woman. At the same time, I should clarify that at that time, I considered myself divorced from you. She knew about my lingering feelings for you, and it was she who prompted me to come back here for a final conversation with you. She wanted us to resolve all my remaining feelings for you before we get married. When I told Lois about Dolores, her face turned pale, and she listened attentively until I finished speaking. It seems Dolores is a wonderful person. It pains me to imagine you with someone else, but I think that's what I deserve. And now I have to ask you a question. During my absence when we were still married, did you have any extramarital affairs? I understand that you are a living person. It's hard for me to understand that, despite your short temper, 
you have remained faithful to me throughout my absence, Mark. Please know that I have remained faithful to you. Deep down, I always believed that someday you would come back to me, and it was very important for me to be able to convince you that I have never violated our sacred marriage vow. I am pleased to hear that, although I can only imagine what difficulties you have faced during this time. She blushed slightly and replied, Someday I'll tell you how I managed to cope with this. But before we can reconcile, I want you to think and make the following promise. If you enter into any form of intimate relationship with another person while we are still married, I will take drastic measures. When I find out that you're with Phil, I'll vent all the anger that consumed me and which was fueled by the belief that you deceived me. When her eyes widened, she fell silent, and I continued, Consider this my solemn oath given to you as a consequence of your betrayal. I understand perfectly well that I will be judged and punished for my actions, but this will not change my promises to you. I struck a quick blow, and the consequences of this act will be reflected in the lives of Jeff, Jill, and their families, forming the legacy that we will leave behind. I want to emphasize that this promise applies even to the time when I was away. When you wish to stay married with me, I understand that this may seem a tough condition, but it is extremely important for you to understand the possible consequences in the event of our reunion. With that, I'm leaving, and we'll meet tomorrow at 7 o'clock in the evening. Then, I will wait for your answer. If you really respect me, then you know that I will fulfill this obligation. When I got up, she was sitting in a state of shock. We didn't exchange a word, and I left. The next evening, at the appointed time, I rang the doorbell again, and as before, she quickly opened it. When she approached, her face showed no emotion. I obediently followed her and entered the living room, where we both sat facing each other. Lois, I began, we talked last night. Now it's your turn. Her response was filled with awe. Mark, you really scared me with your words last night. I can't help thinking that you will carry out your threats. After careful consideration, I understood that either everything I've told you about my past and my unwavering devotion is absolutely true, or it's all a clever invention. Despite this uncertainty, my love for you burns with a deep flame, and I really want you to come back, even if it means having to put up with the consequences of my betrayal. I fully trust and respect you as my husband and promise to remain faithful to you as long as we are together. But I decided that I can't hide one case from you, so I know that I will hurt you again if I don't tell you about it now. After you disappeared, Phil and I had an intimate relationship again, but that was after he and Penny divorced. But after that second time, we didn't see each other again. I couldn't even utter a word. I was so angry that I came back and wanted to give her another chance. How naive I am. She's just a dirty trash. With all my might, I slapped her face with my palm and left. She didn't say another word, as she was shocked by my blow. In the following days, I did everything so that she signed the divorce papers. I also sold our house and gave her half of the money for the house. After calling the children, I told them that I had learned that their mother was a corrupt trash and that I was leaving forever. Fortunately, I managed not to see this vile woman again. Soon, I returned to Dolores and invited her to move in with me. Half a year later, we got married, and now she is expecting a child, my child. As for Lois, I didn't even want to hear about her when I was talking to the kids. But two days ago, my son called me and told me that Lois was seriously ill and asked me to come and visit her. He claimed that his mother was about to die and she was asking to see me one last time. But I made it clear that I didn't care about this lying woman and ended the conversation. It was a punishment for her for her betrayal, deception, and for trying to mislead me again, saying that her betrayal was a one-time thing. I imagine it would hurt me if we got back together with her, and then I would find out that she was sleeping with Phil again. Probably then she wouldn't have gotten off with one slap in the face, and I would be in jail. Story 2 It was an incredibly sad day, an extremely dark Friday for me. In a matter of moments, I realized that my life would plunge into chaos, which I would not be able to control. All I could do at that moment was to wait and see if the expected catastrophe would really break out. And yet, I refused to turn into an imbecile person mired in grief and self-pity. No. I have always adhered to the instructions of my former sergeant received many years ago, the most effective way of self-defense is to be proactive. The only way out is to fight, even if you have to save only your honor, and everything else collapses. Yesterday, 
I received the most important information that gave me enough time to adequately prepare for the upcoming events. So, I settled down in a quiet corner of the motel parking lot, comfortably ensconced in my friend's elegant black PUO 307. The anticipation of my wife's arrival this afternoon filled me with a mixture of anxiety and excitement. I anxiously awaited the appearance of her bright red Toyota Yaris. Finally, my heart leapt as she gracefully pulled into the parking lot, accompanied by her partner, a confident figure who parked his imposing BMW Rex next to her car. After exchanging a few words with my wife, he headed to the reception desk. After getting out of the car, I went to my wife's Toyota, easily opened the unlocked passenger door, and sat down on the seat. To my complete surprise, my wife let out a piercing scream. Completely discouraged by my unexpected appearance, Billy, what are you doing here? Stop it, she screamed. Handing her a brown envelope, I calmly replied, I just brought the divorce papers for my unfaithful future ex-wife. Enjoy your vacation with your esteemed love and do not hesitate to stay in this car for an unlimited time. Her screams grew louder as she vehemently denied my accusations, desperately pleading, No, 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 you got it all wrong. It's not what you think. I wanted to clarify my intentions and let you know that I have no intention of deceiving you. I'm here to discuss the issue of our divorce, regardless of how you feel about the person who hurriedly left for the key to your shared room. If you decide to continue a relationship with him, it will be entirely at your discretion. As I said before, I don't care. It is obvious that my previously affable wife was expecting a more romantic occasion, given her apparent distress caused, presumably, by a passionate affair with her noble companion. At that moment, her supposed real man appeared with a room key. Seeing a tearful Rebecca still sitting in the car, he hurriedly walked over and opened her door, demanding, Who is he? What did he do to you? While he was asking these questions, I got out of the car and took a small plastic bottle out of my pocket. Choking with sobs, Rebecca was able to say, He is my husband, and he intends to divorce me because of us. I am determined to eradicate this stupid thought in the head of this vile man. When my wife's lover came face to face with me, I turned my attention to him, holding a bottle with a mixture of water and shampoo. With a precise movement, I squeezed the bottle, as a result of which a powerful jet of water hit him in the face. From the unexpected blow, he lost his orientation for a moment and let out an angry scream. Taking advantage of this momentary distraction, I quickly took a position behind his back and performed the following action, taking a dart with three prongs securely attached to the tip. I deftly swung my right hand and expertly thrust the dart deep into his left buttock, hidden under trousers and underpants. Thanks to the sharp barbed tip, it got stuck and could not be removed without surgery. In general, my plan was successful, and I decided to leave the clearly unsuccessful lover. His eyes were stinging from the shampoo, the dart was stuck in his buttock, and he was swearing like a madman. At this time, my unfaithful wife was sitting and sobbing loudly in her seat. I got to my car and drove out of the motel parking lot without encountering any further complications. No matter how events unfolded that Friday, one thing remained unchanged. On that day, these two lovers clearly will not be able to engage in intimacy. Let me introduce myself. I am Billy Swanson, a 37-year-old man of Scandinavian descent, happily married to his beloved wife, Rebecca, who is 36 years old. We have two beautiful children, 9-year-old Emil and 7-year-old Estelle. Our journey together has been going on for more than 11 years, and we spent 10 of them in marital happiness. At first glance, it seems that we have everything that any couple in our position wants. And yet, I have to admit with a heavy heart that our happiness is slipping away from us. In my humble opinion, the main reason for our dissatisfaction lies in none other than Rebecca's mother. Despite the lack of green color tail and the ability to breathe fire, here she undoubtedly embodies the essence of a hostile dragon who constantly uses every opportunity to complicate my life. This troubled relationship began with our first meeting when I was kindly invited to dinner at Rebecca's house. But instead of a pleasant evening, it was more like a tense interrogation. The dragon inundated me with relentless questions, eventually expressing his disapproval of my name only because it begins with the letter I. Upper-class families would never call their children by such common names as Billy, Kenny, Ronnie, Molly, Nellie, Cindy, and the like. I couldn't help but appreciate this fact. To my surprise, 
both Rebecca and her weak-willed father chose to remain silent, allowing the dragon to further humiliate me. She went on to explain that Swanson was a typical farmer surname that originated at a time when sons inherited their father's names, and the word son was put at the end of the surname. Having expressed her disappointment with Rebecca's prospects, she continued her hopes for a more suitable couple, given that Rebecca's sister Natalie is engaged to an outstanding gentleman from a respected family. Tired of the conversation, I got up from my seat and intervened in the conversation, questioning the reputation of the father of this man who allegedly came from a less respected branch of the family and stressing that because of his unemployment, he was forced to use state aid. Without waiting for an answer, I asked Rebecca to come with me to another place, and to my surprise, she agreed, and we quickly left this, as it seemed to me, hostile place. I've known Natalie's boyfriend, Alexander, since school days. It came as no surprise to me that he, using his abilities to deceive, managed to deceive Rebecca's strange mother and make her believe that he was the perfect match for Natalie. To be honest, it didn't concern me, and what does it matter to me? Naturally, I didn't get an invitation to Natalie and Alexander's lavish wedding, but I didn't care about that either. The really important thing for me was our connection with Rebecca, which only grew stronger over time until it reached such heights that it led to her unwanted pregnancy. Her call ignited a dragon in me, and she expressed her sarcastic opinion, calling me a disgusting scumbag in the eyes of herself and other respected people. In addition, she made it clear that a wedding at her expense is completely unacceptable. In search of solace, Rebecca and I took refuge in the famous Scandinavian church of Los Cristianos located on the picturesque Spanish Canary Island of Tenerife, where we exchanged vows. By the will of fate, both Rebecca and I were offered wonderful vacancies in a city located 210 kilometers from our beloved hometown. I had little contact with her mother because she was completely focused on Natalia and Alexandra, investing her strength and considerable funds in them. But the following years turned out to be prosperous for Rebecca, me, and our two children. We achieved financial stability, acquired a beautiful house, and established numerous friendships in a new area. Our intimate relationship was still satisfying despite the geographical distance. My communication with Rebecca's family was minimal since her parents never visited us. On the contrary, when we returned to our hometown to visit my family, Rebecca spent time with hers. In the end, Alexander reached the limit in his relationship with the dragon, whom we all knew as his mother-in-law. To everyone's surprise, he successfully coped with the job and readily agreed to the promotion that required him to move 280 kilometers away. After a series of disagreements with Natalia, he gave her a direct ultimatum, either agree to move or get divorced. Reluctantly, she decided to accompany him to his new place of work. It was then that the dragon, seemingly forgetting about her daughter Rebecca, began to contact her daily. Over time, Rebecca involuntarily began to move away from me. Our conversations boiled down to constant complaints about my actions, inaction, and missed opportunities, accompanied by endless praise for Natalia and Alexander for their supposedly happy life. Rebecca's story that the reason for Alexander's departure was the desire to escape from the domineering mother-in-law only aggravated our already strained relations. Unfortunately, it seemed that trouble never comes alone. As Rebecca's feelings towards me continued to cool, she began to communicate with a man from a distant branch of a prestigious family. Soon, she began to call him a model of masculinity, if not a real superhero. Although he was married to a nurse, his wife was currently in Tanzania, Africa, where she selflessly worked as a medical volunteer in one of the local centers, and about three months remained until the end of her trip. This admirable man and his wife planned to purchase a house upon their return, but for now, he lived in our city, renting a room from his married daughter-in-law. Rebecca's constant comparisons of my business, my vocabulary, and even my clothes with the man's and her company really annoyed me. Needless to say, in the end, I always felt like a loser in these comparisons. Despite that, we were still close, but my attempts were often met with comments like, Again? Can you never be satisfied? If it weren't for our children and Rebecca's few admirable qualities, I would have ended this relationship long ago. But I couldn't deny her loyalty and devotion. As a good mother who loved to cook, she always kept herself in good physical shape, and together we kept our house and beautiful garden clean. If she hadn't started picking on me and making negative comments about me, then in my eyes, she would have been the perfect wife. Naturally, 
I was not the one who tolerated her behavior without expressing my opinion. Unfortunately, this only worsened our problems. For example, one night when her children were already asleep, she said, I would like you to be like my colleague. If you're so in love with this dishonest man, why don't you file for divorce and become his submissive companion? Of course, I will not tolerate infidelity as long as we are married. If you decide to sleep with this person without my knowledge, I will let you know that even though you are acting promiscuous, your actions will have consequences. Rebecca started screaming hysterically, you're just a disgusting person. What did you just say about me? How dare you call me a traitor? Rest assured, you will be responsible for your words. Wouldn't it be more correct if your clients paid for their actions? I replied angrily before she could answer something unpleasant. Two frightened and tearful children came up to us. I tried to calm them down, wanting to defuse the situation. Subsequently, we experienced two incredibly cold weeks after its sudden outbreak. The first weekend, she took our children to her parents, and the next weekend, Natalia and Alexander came to us. All this time, Rebecca played the role of an obedient wife and treated me kindly until our guests left on Sunday morning. Saying goodbye to them, she said the words, Don't expect favors from me. The fall began the following Thursday when one of Rebecca's colleagues contacted me during office hours. After a short acquaintance, the situation took an unexpected turn. In short, a new charismatic colleague has appeared at our workplace, and three of his employees claim his attention. Among them are your wife, me, and another unmarried girl. Despite our requests to your wife to back off, as she is happily married, she decided to ignore our advice. Now, she's proudly bragging that she won our little competition and plans to meet him at the motel tomorrow afternoon. I thanked her and managed to convince her to leave this conversation between us so that I could deal with the current issue. After a long day at work, I returned home and noticed that Rebecca seemed to be in a more upbeat mood than usual. When I got comfortable, the phone call suddenly brought back memories of my service in the army. An old sergeant was talking about Apache warriors in the territory of ancient Arizona, praising their clever tactics to take the enemy by surprise, arrange a furious attack, and quickly escape. Realizing that I had no experience in street fighting, I knew that imitating legendary warriors was my only chance to win. Rebecca has already mentioned her impressive black belt in one of the male Japanese martial arts. The element of surprise was of great importance. Unfortunately, pepper spray, the ideal option, was banned and unavailable in our country. So, I had to look for a simple alternative. Having settled on a small plastic bottle filled with a mixture of shampoo for hair and water, I was convinced that this was an effective weapon after I experienced the painful sensation of getting it in my eyes. The sergeant told us about the tremendous effectiveness of silent arrows with jagged tips, strategically launched from a hidden ambush, which terrified soldiers during the border wars in Arizona. Naturally, a collision with Rebecca's lover with a bow and arrow was out of the question, but this idea gave me an idea that directed me to my modest basement workshop. There, I found the nearest object at hand, a dartboard. Applying my soldering skills, I attached three sewing needles, each measuring just a centimeter, at a slight angle around the tip of the dart, creating a jagged edge. According to my plan, this modified dart was supposed to dig into a tender area of the body, making its removal without surgical intervention in the hospital very problematic. I didn't have the slightest desire to experiment with this weapon on myself. After careful consideration, I came up with a simple strategy that did not require investing money in expensive equipment. I decided to use the divorce papers as a distraction to blind Rebecca and her lover for a moment and quietly inject a barbed dart into his anus. I assumed that this unexpected discomfort would most likely discourage him from entering into further intimate relations with my unfaithful wife. The next morning, despite the fact that Rebecca was wearing a provocative dress, I tried not to pay attention to her features and refrained from commenting on her appearance. On Friday morning, we set off along the usual route to work. I swapped cars with my colleague and close friend Eric, as we often did when he needed my Volvo V70 instead of his more compact Peugeot 307. Later in the morning, I visited the court to get the divorce forms and filled out one of them in my office. After a short search, I successfully contacted the main office of the charity in Tanzania and received the email address of Rebecca's lover's wife. At lunchtime, I went to work at Rebecca's. Arriving at the place, I saw that her and her lover's cars were still in the parking lot. 
Apparently, before going to the motel, they had dinner together at one of the nearby establishments. In this regard, I decided to buy a couple of hot dogs and go to the motel to patiently wait for their arrival. As you have already understood, the lovers eventually showed up at the motel, and my carefully thought-out plan was implemented flawlessly. In this regard, I felt a sense of gratitude to the old sergeant because my stay in the army was not in vain. At exactly half past three, the house phone rang. I got a call from a familiar female voice who had previously informed me about Rebecca's visit to the motel yesterday. She asked if I went to the motel today and if everything turned out as I expected. Thanking her for her help, I confirmed that I had indeed visited the motel, but unfortunately, my presence was met with dissatisfaction by colleagues. Trying to cheer up my wife, I decided to give her the divorce papers, but it didn't seem to bring her joy. As a result, the man began to threaten me with physical violence, which forced me to defend myself, as a result of which he received several injuries to the back of his body. Apparently, my wife took him to the hospital. In my opinion, the date was not particularly romantic. Did I understand correctly? Yes, that's right. I have no intention of deceiving you. Although my wife is not at home right now, you can contact her by mobile phone and ask her, but I can't guarantee that she will tell the whole truth. Subsequently, this person, whose identity remained unknown, gratefully asked for Rebecca's mobile phone number, which I willingly provided. I hope their conversation was pleasant. Here's the corrected version of the text. After that, I wrote a letter with a detailed description of the whole situation to the wife of a real man living in Africa. Rebecca returned home at exactly four o'clock. Her face was displeased. After looking at me intently, she said sharply, we need to talk, and it can't wait any longer. I told her it wasn't a problem for me. You and your companion have achieved your goal, but you are probably mistaken if you think that I will just endure the humiliation that you and your supposed real man wanted to inflict on me. No, Rebecca, I would never tolerate such treatment without defending my dignity, I replied firmly. Even though he didn't do you any harm, you hurt him so much that I had to rush him to the emergency room of the hospital. I assure you, you will answer for it. In fact, four adults and two children are involved in the case. I informed her that we will share the costs of eliminating the consequences of your actions and the actions of this disgusting person. You cannot underestimate the seriousness of the situation, imagining that a nurse in Africa will be pleased to receive my letter exposing you and her husband. Now she knows what a shameful fraudster she married and how wrongly she trusted him. Did you really commit such a cruel act towards his unsuspecting wife? Even threatening me with divorce was incredibly cruel. I didn't threaten you with anything. All you have to do is just sign the divorce papers, and within six months, you will receive fair conditions in order to become a free woman. Refusing to sign and contacting a lawyer will entail significant costs, but in the end, you will still find yourself in the same conditions. At that moment, she realized that I was serious and started crying. Oh my God, are you serious? Please, I beg you, listen to me. I didn't do anything wrong. No, I did. By joining your intellectually disabled mother's dissatisfaction with my lack of a prestigious surname, you succumbed to her influence and became an irritable person towards me. It seems that you are confusing romantic feelings for a colleague whom you consider superior to me in all respects. Judging by the constant comments, moreover, I found out that you arranged a competition with two unmarried colleagues to get a date with this self-confident real man. Having won this absurd competition, you left work early this morning and went to a motel to get your reward. It is quite possible that you have betrayed my trust by entering into a relationship with a married man. Given my firm position against treason, the consequences of your actions are beyond doubt. I want to emphasize that I have never cheated on you, neither now nor in the past. You're the only man I really love. Have you forgotten that we have two children together? What about their well-being? It's only thanks to our children that I haven't thrown you out on the street for a long time. I constantly, day after day, hear criticism about my shortcomings from both your mother and yourself. I feel inferior when I compare myself with this unpleasant person, the person you chose, who seemed to genuinely care about you and whom you met at the motel. It highlights my worthlessness. Your attempt to deceive me has led to the fact that I feel humiliated, and I'm completely tired of all the other nonsense that you constantly expose me to. 
Eventually, she realized that the games were over and we started to discuss the terms of our divorce. Rebecca agreed to sign the papers after we came to the understanding that we would both continue to live in our shared house and not meet anyone else during the six-month divorce process. Six weeks have passed, and amazing changes have taken place in the remnants of my marriage. I have met a truly exceptional wife whose virtues surpass all my previous ideas. Surprisingly, a deep metamorphosis took place with Rebecca, which seems to have erased all memories of my past inadequacy. Now, our communication retains the appearance of civility, and we participate in various events much more often than in the months preceding our obvious troubles. Naturally, our relationship during sleep no longer involves sharing a bed and a bedroom. For a short period until she attempted treason, she hastily rendered me small services. It may seem absurd, but I believe her when she says that she has never entered into physical intimacy with her partner. The meeting at the motel was supposed to mark the beginning of their love affair with periodic outbursts of passion, but her partner's wife insisted that he go to Tanzania to volunteer at an aid camp. Until her own commitments ended, he went there, trying to save his marriage, and his wife contacted me by email, assuring me of his well-being and expressing her forgiveness towards him. She even begged me to forgive her. Rebecca, I do not know what steps to take since there are about 20 weeks left before the official completion of our divorce. At the same time, it will be intriguing to see whether Rebecca is truly devoted to her role as a faithful wife and how long she will be able to keep it. The situation may be significantly affected by the fact that the famous dragon will prefer to hide in the depths of Lake Champlain or just stay in its nest. I've been thinking for a long, long time about what to do next, divorce or forgive. From now on, selfish Rebecca lives with her narcissistic mother. I couldn't stand the sight of her around me anymore, as it seemed strange to me that she did not object to the fact that our children would remain under my 100% custody. Apparently, this wandering woman will continue to look for adventures in the arms of a strange man. Recently, I was going to take the children to Rebecca and her parents, as discussed earlier. The day before I left, I called my ex-mother-in-law to warn her about our arrival. When she answered my call, I felt something wrong in her voice. There was a feeling that she was crying, which was unreal for this ruthless woman. She asked me not to bring the children because now is not the right time. I did not ask her and ended the conversation. But not understanding the situation, I decided to call Rebecca's father to find out why I can't take the children away, as they were so looking forward to this moment. Rebecca's father said that he was in a serious condition because all this time she had been leading a wild lifestyle. Having recently learned that she was HIV positive, she got very drunk and got behind the wheel, subsequently getting into a serious accident and knocking down two people. She herself suffered greatly and is now chained to a hospital bed. According to her father, doctors do not believe in Rebecca's full recovery, and most likely she will remain disabled and will be able to move only with the help of a wheelchair. My former father-in-law cried bitterly when he told me the consequences of his daughter's reckless behavior. He asked me to take care of the children and say hello to them. What he said at the end of our conversation really struck me. It's her selfish mother's fault that Rebecca turned from a cute girl into a narcissistic and wandering girl and is now bedridden.